So, hi, and um, welcome to my talk. Um, I'm really happy to be speaking here because I'm just super pleased that a Swiss Python summit exists. It makes me really happy. Um, so, yeah, um, as it said on my slides, I'm Ray Nola. Um, I am a Python and PHP developer, dabbling in a couple of other things. Um, Mostly at the moment, I'm writing Symfony, which is a PHP framework, but I also do CCAN and Django, which are Python. Um, my handle is up there. Uh, the pronouns I use in English are they, so gender-neutral pronouns. And I work at Leap in Zurich, which probably some of you know. Probably this is the most important part of my talk this afternoon. These are the languages I speak. I speak English and German, and I'm kind of learning Spanish and Swedish um, on Duolingo. So that means that I don't really speak any of the languages I'm going to be showing you in this um, presentation. Um, which means if there are terrible mistakes in what I tell you, it is entirely down to me. Okay, let's go. It's kind of a world tour. But we start off at home, Python 3. I guess most of us are either using Python 3 now or want to because Python 3 is awesome. Um, and yeah, it is awesome because, well, for lots of reasons, um, but the one that I'm focusing here, of course, is Unicode by default. Um, before, up till Python 2, um, you had strings, which were ASCII, and anything else, any special characters um, you needed to um, have Unicode strings and preface that with a U, like this, U fubar. Um, and this is a beautiful example of privilege in action. I come from an English-speaking country, and when I learned to code, ASCII was fine. Um, then I moved, well, I started learning to code. Then I moved over to Zurich, and I got my first job um, in Zurich, my first programming job, which was basically scraping data off websites and processing the results. And all of a sudden, all my code stopped working. What was going on? I kept seeing this. Unicode and code error. I just want to say, you know, this house is in Zurich with an umlaut. Oh, right. Um, then I got interested in basically everything I'm going to tell you in the talk. Um, so, okay, we've already had one example of an error, of a, a difficulty in someone's life, my life, that can be caused by um, Unicode and different character sets. I just wanted an umlaut and I got an error. Uh, these people, on the other hand, um, just wanted to send texts, and they died. These, these people are both dead, I'm sorry. Um, this is Ramazan Chalchaban and his ex-wife, Emina Chalchaban. Um, and they were living in Turkey because they were both Turkish, and they were divorcing, which means sending angry texts back and forth because that's the thing that happens. And one day, um, he was getting really cross in this argument, and he just wanted to tell his ex-wife, every time you run out of arguments, you just change the subject. Unfortunately, um, the phone that he sent his message on had a character that hers didn't. So when she got the message, it looked like he was saying something really kind of obscene and insulting about her. She showed it to her family, her family got angry. Eventually, everyone ended up in a big fight, both of these people got stabbed, and they bled to death. And this is, this is, you know, beyond my troubles. This is why localization is so important, people. <laughs> people die. <laughs> so the exact problem um, that caused these, these deaths, um, unfortunately, is also a problem we have in Python. Um, this is where you can really... This is the first thing I'm going to show you where you can slip up, also in Python, even Python 3, with Unicode per default. Um, Turkish has two letters I, um, and both of these I's, there's one with a dot and one without a dot. And both of these have small and capital versions. So dotless small, dot, dotless big, um, dotted small, and dotted big I. And they all obviously have different um, Unicode code points. Um, I hope you can read this, because I had some um, trouble with the screen. And, um, but I think from here, it probably looks fine. Okay, 
So, you know, Python has been around for a while, Turkish has been also around for a while. We should be able to solve this. Um, <laughs> import locale and set the locale uh, to Turkish, UTF-8. Okay. And then I have my, um, my array here of Turkish letters, two dotless I's, two dotted I's. Okay. And then I want to print the capital version of all of these um, letters. You can probably see letters two and four there. We have capital dotless I, capital dotted I. And unfortunately, the dotted small I has also become dotless on the way up. And if we take the same Turkish letters string and print it in lowercase, um, yeah, everyone has gained a dot, or the, the capital dotless I on the way down has gained a dot. And this is dangerous, as we've talked about. Um, this is not great. And this is like, this is just, this is just what you get by default when you set your locale to Turkish. This is kind of terrible, actually. Um, so there are two solutions that I found for this. Um, one is you can import um, Pi ICU, which is the Python extension for um, IBM's international components for the Unicode C++ library. Um, and that solves the problem. You just you import it, you, well, you compile it if you don't have it already on your computer, and then you use it, and this takes care of this and probably lots of other issues. The problem is if you just want to do a little script, like if you're in the Turkish version of my old job and you want to get data from websites, that's kind of heavy duty. So you can just throw your hands in the air, make a translation table, and use str.translate to replace the characters as a workaround. Um, and you'd better do it. Moving on to, I noticed when I was putting this presentation together that we're more or less moving eastwards across the world. So this is stop two on our tour. Um, Middle East, this is a picture of a street corner in Jerusalem, um, because we're going to talk about right to left writing systems, of which Hebrew is an obvious example. So I quite like this picture because we have um, the Hebrew name and the, uh, well, the transliterated name um, of this street. And you can see from the sizes of the fonts, obviously, one goes right to left, one goes left to right. Um, that isn't a problem if you're just writing by hand. You know, everyone can do that. But unfortunately, we have a wrinkle with Unicode. Um, we have now two directions, um, and we have two ways of thinking about the directions. Um, one is just how it's written, and one is logical order. So in the street, uh, the street name, say we wanted to, um, it was a string and we wanted to put it into our program. First off, we would start out in the top right-hand corner and put in those small letters, a uh, quote mark, the big letters, a quote mark. And then on the next line, of course, we would put in simtat aluf batslot. Um, and that's, yeah, that's the logical order. It's the way a reader reads it. Um, and that means we need extra support in Python. It doesn't come in naturally. Um, luckily, this one has a really easy solution. We install Python by, by die or by D. Not quite sure how to say that. Bidirectional support. And I think that actually was um, written by a bunch of Israeli programmers, I'm pretty sure. Um, and you just use it totally simply like this. You import it, you get the method that you want, you have a Hebrew string, this means Academy of the Hebrew Language, seemed appropriate. And when you want to display it, you get display of this string, and it's correct there. Right to left text is easy. What are we worrying about? We have nothing to worry about. Arabic. <laughs> um, Arabic is also... Um, a right to left written language. And we have an added kind of convolution here because the Arabic letters change shape depending on where they're written in the word. This is just um, from the Wikipedia page. It's a nice diagram showing for a bunch of different letters that are isolated, so on their own, and in the end, middle, and beginning, um, they have different forms. Uh, and actually, a friend of a friend has a really good blog that I was 
going to add to this um, to this talk. I will add the link before I put the slides online, uh, which is just called "That's Not Arabic," um, and it's just photographs of all of the messed up. Arabic texts he sees around the place. And really, this is the biggest problem that I've seen in his examples, um, that it comes out looking like the top picture when it should look like the bottom picture. Um, of course, because this is Python, and we have an amazing open source community, and also because this is a problem that affects quite a lot of people. Lots of people speak Arabic. Um, someone wrote this really awesome um, library, which you can just import, and, oh, no, okay, I don't have a code example for this one. Um, but yeah, this guy wrote this um, library, or I think, in fact, adapted it from an Android library, and you can just call it, and it reshapes your letters, and I have, I have the impression that this is way easier to read if you're an Arabic reader than the top one, which would just be like spelling it out like Morse code. Okay, so that's fine, we've had problems and we've fixed them. And now we're going to go to something which is basically the first thing that really intrigued me, even before I had my first programming job. Um, I was working at university and, you know, quite often had to get information on people from their websites. And a lot of these people were from um, China and Japan, say. And I always think, okay, right, the first page of their website looks beautiful. It's obviously made by a designer to, like, the marketing group's specifications, what their university should look like. But as soon as you drill down into the individual um, group pick pages or individual professors' pages, the writing gets all kind of funky. Like, the spacing is not right. Some of it really looks kind of weird. Some people think this looks ugly, but I actually have a big soft spot for it. What was going on? I decided to find out, and the answer is the top line there are full-width characters, and the bottom line are half-width characters. That's actually what we're used to um, here in the West. Um, and in fact, in some places, this is a di just a different font. This is Korean U. Bottom line looks lovely, like a typewriter, and the top line is just more or less the same as the last one. They just didn't even bother styling those characters. Um, so, okay, we know this is because of something to do with how they write in Chinese. And the, the answer is um, that over there, the default for their character sets, obviously all of these letters, um, ideograms, have their own um, code points in Unicode as well. It's how come I could code so easily put them in my, spread, my slideshow? Um, that's the default. So these are Han characters that are actually used in Chinese, Japanese, and sometimes in Korean. And they're quite wide because there's a lot of detail to get in there. Um, then Japanese also has two different, um, not really alphabets, sets of characters. And this one is kana. Um, and this comes in two flavors, full width and half width. And the half width are usually used for digital displays. Um, and then Jap Japanese also has hiragana. And they're always full width as well. Um, and so these should all be in the same font. You can see that they all come out quite differently. And you can imagine, or you don't have to imagine because I'm showing you, um, if you try to combine these beautiful full-width characters with tiny little Western um, Roman alphabet half-width characters, it just looks off. The kerning is completely wrong. So we needed to develop these uh, full-width equivalents to all of the Roman letters. Um, and that's great. And the thing is, fonts which are aimed at a Chinese or Japanese market, um, you know, put lots of effort into styling the Chinese and Japanese characters. But the Roman characters are always going to be an afterthought. Um, and that's why quite often they just, they look kind of bad. To someone from Europe who's used to reading English, you go to a beautiful website, all of the Japanese or Chinese text is styled, and then they have to put something in um, English, and it's just like, you are making us look bad. Um, <laughs> but sometimes you've got to do what you've got to do. Uh, and I imagine that um, the Chinese characters in fonts, which are mostly aimed at English-speaking people, also look pretty crap if you're used to the nicer ones they have over there. Okay, so we have to deal with this in um, Python. Say you need to um, 
you need to localize a website and you need to make it look nice for a Far Eastern viewer, and that means full width characters. Um, and I really thought, I felt like there has to be a simple way to do this, just like add 200 to the Unicode code point or something. Um, and that really doesn't work. You can do some maths and you can make your own translation table, but actually it's surprisingly hard and horrible. Um, luckily, we live in this glorious open, open source um, ecosystem and you can just install J-A-C-O-N-V, J-A-C-O-N-V, um, which trans, um, trans, transforms um, these are uh, Kana characters between half width and full width, and also works with Roman characters, and also kind of handles other um, character sets to make them do what it's expected that they do. Um, funny thing here is the... Um, you can see all the letters obviously look like letters. Um, here we have this U3000 character in the middle. That is the ideographic space. And it's just stranded on its own somewhere out in Unicode, not really next to anything else. Um, OK, so full width and half width. OK, this is my favorite part of the whole talk. This is possibly the bit where I geek out a bit too much. Um, I really, really love the Korean writing system. Um, it's just, it was developed in the 15th century uh, at the court of the Korean king Sejong the Great. And before this um, alphabet got invented, they, you know, the people there who were writing had their own way of writing and it looked very beautiful, but it wasn't really. It wasn't really so logical. It wasn't really so, you know, so easy. It wasn't, it wasn't what he wanted. He wanted something that was just um, not ideographic. Um, it's phonetic, as you can possibly see. There are sort of um, Roman letters there to show you the signs of the letters. And he basically told his guys, okay, sit down, come up with something better, and they came up with something better. Um, it's a phonetic alphabet. It reads left to right. And each of these blobs, which is colored a different color, is a different letter, essentially. But they're generally arranged in these blocks of three. And so this um, is actually the name of the writing system. It's Hangul. And I'm not sure if you can read the size of it, but basically, the yellow um, circle and lines is a H sound. Then we have an A sound next to it, and an N sound next to it. And then here we have G, U, uh, U, so Hangul. And yeah, it was just, it was so much better, so much more efficient um, that now the old style of Korean writing is really a rarity. You don't really see it. Okay, um, obviously, since we are also logical, efficient modern people, we need to encode this and return it for our Korean reading website visitors or what have you. And I'm just going to take a quick step back um, to talk about Unicode equivalents. Um, because, yeah, because we're going to need it. And it's slightly, um, it's slightly involved. I won't give you the full explanation, but I have put a link here to, um, yeah, to a Python doc where it basically tells you what I'm going to tell you, but with more words. So there are two kinds of equivalents in Unicode, character equivalents. And one is canonical equivalents. And this is where we get into it with Korean. Like I just told you, this character on the far left means the same as the three on the right. They both make the sound Han. Um, and you can totally write Korean like this, letter by letter. It just looks kind of ugly, and also I imagine it's quite hard to read. But it means the same thing. Um, and then on the other hand, ah, yeah. And this gets normalized in two different ways. We have um, NFD, normal form D, um, which tells us, you know, I have this, this far left character and I want to find the normal form D of it. It's these three. Um, and normal form C is the, um, is the canonical, um, thank you, it is, it's the composite. <laughs> 
um, the normalized composition, um, which says, yeah, but the real way to write this character is like this. And then we also have um, compatibility equivalents. Um, for historical reasons, when they were putting together uh, Unicode, there are some letters which, are, which look the same, which are the same. You could totally use them in place of one another, but we have two code points for them. Um, and so a good example is Roman numeral one, which is really just the same as the capital letter I. Um, and so, hang on, sorry, my notes are on this page. Um, and so you can also have the normal form KD and KC, where K stands for compatibility, of course. Um, thank you, 10 minutes. Um, which basically applies the compatibility decomposition. You give it Roman numeral one, and it says, oh, we could actually use an I. Um, and then it does the canonical decomposition, as we see here. Um, yeah, in the Python docs on Unicode, there's a much better explanation of this. But anyway, you now know that there are multiple ways to write the same kind of thing, um, especially in Korean. And so I thought I would have a play with this. Um, we have this Korean string, again, it's Hangul. Um, and I want to take each character one at a time, and I just want to print the normalized version of that uh, NFD, so canonical normalization. And it tells me Hangul is the same as Han and Gul. OK, great. And again, just to reiterate what I told you, the compatibility normalization uh, character by character, yep, I should write those together like this, that's great. Um, so if I'm in, that was for the characters alone, if I'm in my terminal and I want to print the normalization, um, the canonical normalization of the whole string, um, you would think that, okay, it would be like these three characters and then these three characters. And it's not. I get this mess. That's just in my regular terminal in Ubuntu. Um, and I think what happens is it knows this is basically two characters. Um, they've been normalized to be represented as three characters, but that doesn't matter to the terminal. Um, and so it only allots the width for each character that the composed block would need and they just kind of mesh up on top of each other like this. Um, and this is really only a display thing. Um, I just saved that to a file, and you can see that I got what I would expect there. Um, but yeah, it just kind of shows you that lots of people, not just Python writers and cell phone software writers, who should be taking um, notice of this, kind of slip up a lot of the time with these writing systems. You know, one character is one character has the width of one character. We've seen multiple ways in which that's not true. OK, so far this is all mostly all been quite cosmetic. Um, obviously, because it's Unicode and computers, there are security implications of this kind of, um, of this, these matters. And security in computing is a huge topic, which I really can't touch on in the next eight minutes of my talk. Um, and, and I'm not going to try. If you want to learn about security implications, there's some links in the next slides. You can start there, and you will figure it out on your own. But here are some things to think about. Um, obviously, SQL injection is a pretty big potential vulnerability for websites. Um, here we have an example string where the string is surrounded in single quotes. And if a user puts in, I don't like raisins, then they use um, an apostrophe, which is a single quote. Um, and that could spell the end of the string to the computer system that's analyzing this and potentially storing it in a database. So we sanitize it. We just put an escape character in front of the apostrophe. Um, and then when we read that back, we're like, oh, yeah, no, this is still in the string. OK, I don't like raisins is the full string. Now, the hex encoding of this escape character is 0x5c. Just hold that in your brains for a moment. Because it turns out that um, when you get you know, pretty 
far up in the Unicode planes to encode. I mean, there are thousands of characters in Chinese, I think. So this one, for example, which I don't know what it means. I think I did when I wrote this talk, and then I forgot. Um, it's really big. We have to encode it with um, two, two points. Um, so we have 0xb8, 0x5c. That sounds familiar. So if instead of um, I don't like um, raisins, we had put something in like this, 0xb8, and then um, a dash, and then um, something which will really fuck up um, our database. And goes, oh, or if one equals one, okay. And then I pass this into my database and say, I'm looking for a phone number where, um, you know, the username is something, or one equals one. And then my database will happily return all of the phone numbers, which I probably don't want an attacker to have. Um, okay. That's fine, normally we sanitize. So we look at this and we think, hey, an apostrophe, oh, I'd best sanitize that. I stick 0x5c in front of it, and then later on, when I'm reading this, I'm like, oh, hey, this Chinese character. OK, right, so we're looking for a phone number where the username is this Chinese character, or where 1 equals 1. Here's all of the phone numbers. This is a problem. Um, most systems that you use, like most um, ORMs, um, will probably know about this by now. Uh, don't try rolling your own without taking a account of this. Um, and yeah, th there are definitely still, this is the link where I got this particular example from, but there are definitely still vulnerabilities relating to this. And I have about four and a half minutes left, so let's finally have time for one more example. Um, I wrote this talk over last summer, and I think I was about halfway through sort of getting through it when um, this article got published, and I was just so happy. I spent two days going around, have you heard about this awesome new address bar spoofing thing? And everyone was like, Ray, what? what? It's 3 a.m., why are you calling me? <laughs> but I think it's cool. Um, so, thinking about what we talked about kind of 20 minutes ago in um, logical order for Unicode, you can probably already see how this is going to go. Um, imagine we just had the far right section there of the address, and I put it into my address bar. Um, the address bar would be like, yeah, that's Arabic. We can handle that, right to left. And yeah, okay, well, if we had the left side, the browser would be like, yeah, Roman characters, right to left, ding. But it kind of, Chrome and also Firefox last summer, um, someone discovered that they had this kind of difficulty with the full URL there. Because you see the, um, the character in the middle that's still in white um, is a slash. And obviously a slash can be included in left to right or right to left um, text. And somehow when... Um, when it tried to analyze this full thing, it would be like, oh, left to right, okay, oh, right to left. And the presence of this neutral character at this point in the string would cause it to evaluate the whole thing um, right to left, but display it left to right. So I thought I was going, for example, I thought I was going to some google.com hosted page. And in fact, I was going to this URL with just google.com as, um, as part of the path. And I'm sure no one ever really had any trouble with this because, I mean, a slash. When was the last time you saw a slash in a URL? We hardly use those anymore. Um, yeah, here's, here's a lovely quote, just quickly because I have about two minutes, um, from the Google security team. We recognize that the address bar is the only reliable security indicator in modern browsers. And at least for a little while last summer, this was not reliable at all. It's fixed now. So my conclusions, just before I finish up, um, this stuff is not really necessarily easy. 
You think it is because you know how to type and you know how to handle text and Unicode, but there are subtle things just all over the place um, because it turns out we developed writing simultaneously in loads of places across the world. Um, and we didn't standardize first. We didn't form a commission, which we should have done thousands of years ago. <laughs> but I hope you agree that it's super interesting. And my more positive takeaway is... Um, that you will never be the first person to have your particular problem with handling text in Unicode in Python. Probably someone out there has already made a library that will take care of your problem. Um, and it will be open source. And life is beautiful. And also use Python 3, because it just you start from a better position. Even though it can't help you with everything, you're already a leg up on where you would have been a while ago. And yeah, here are some more further links, things that I found were useful. And I'm going to, like I said, add a link to That's Not Arabic, because it's funny. That's it. Thank you. All right, we're going to take one question uh, while Rafael is setting up his gear. Any questions? In the front. Thank you for the talk. It's really great. I just was curious if you know about any software or library that helps you with languages that switch from left, left to right and right to left every other line. Oh, yeah. Like That's like Egyptian, ancient Greek, Egyptian, right? Oh, sorry? Egyptian hieroglyphs, for instance. Yeah. No, I haven't found anything like that, but that's a really fantastic question, and I will have to look th for that. Um, I don't think there are many ancient Egyptians writing Python code, but <laughs> <laughs> if there are, I will find them. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's thanks, Ray.